We are lucky to have our very own Ben Lyons with us, presenting to us on issues that I know we all care about right now related to partisanship in media, misinformation, disinformation, and the general state of uh, our public discourse. And so he's going to be presenting some of his awesome research. So if you don't know already, I'm sure everyone in the room probably knows, but for those of who will be watching this later on, uh, on video, uh, ben Lyons is Assistant Professor of Communication at the University of Utah, studying the intersection of media, politics, and public understanding of science. His research centers on misinformation and misperceptions, their origins, effects, and steps to address them. He uses surveys, experiments, web tracking data, and spatial data in his work. His research has been published in journals such as the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Nature, Human Behavior, Risk Analysis, and Vaccine as well as featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, CNN, Der Spiegel, and other outlets. His work has been supported by the European Research Council and the Democracy Fund. So we're lucky to have him on our faculty, and we're lucky to have him talking to us today, in person no less. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ben, and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> really happy to be here today in person. I'm not sure that we'll need all this time to talk about just this one study, right? But we have a really generous time slot here so we can luxuriate in the details of this research. So today, uh, specifically, I'm going to be talking about uh, age differences and susceptibility to misinformation, kind of unpacking what conventional wisdom is and why I might have a different perspective. Specifically, as you can tell and as you've seen from the announcements, the talk is called Partisanship Not Illiteracy, Explaining Older Americans' Vulnerability to Dubious News. So I want to begin with a formality in that when we're talking about misinformation, we should not assume that uh, what the, these effects might be, right? So here I have sort of a formality in which I will detail that it does have negative effects indeed, right? So it is something we should be concerned about. However, you know, I'll give some context about the size of this issue in subsequent slides, right? So here's a review of just some of my recent research uh, looking at the effects. So we know that even single exposures to misinformation can increase misperceptions about the relevant topics being covered. Um, and that's in that top article there published in Misinformation Review. Um, we know that these effects compound over time. So for instance, multiple exposures to the same piece of misinformation can increase the size of those misperceptions or the stickiness of those misperceptions. We know that exposure to misinformation, for instance, about unsubstantiated claims of voter fraud, as we often see in the 2020 election, but specifically in research conducted during the 2018 midterms, we find that exposure to these messages from elected officials uh, decreased confidence in institutions, specifically in that case, confidence in elections, right? And so these are sort of the bedrock of our society to our democracy, right? So, uh, and these are simply uh, studies of single exposures, right? Or at best, a few exposures in, in, in the studies examining effects that compound over time. And in work that I've already presented to all of you three years ago, uh, we know that even implicit cues, say to uh, conspiracy theory rather than one that's explicitly stated, can increase those conspiracy beliefs, right? So we know that uh, people are generally susceptible to, you know, even to single exposures, especially if we're looking at misperceptions. Uh, our knowledge about the, the longer term effects of misinformation are a little more shaky, you know, we tend to have to rely on correlational data, but it's likely that these have longer term cumulative effects on cynicism, trust in institutions more broadly beyond these single shot effects, right? So we've, studied, uh, we've established at least initially that misinformation is indeed bad, so it's something we should worry about, right? However, to give us some context, we need to think about what the degree of this exposure is, right? And so uh, repeated studies have shown that overall consumption is actually quite low, right? So if we look at this breakdown of the average uh, media consumption, all that blue is, is non-news to begin with, right? So most media is non-news consumption, it's entertainment, et cetera, whether it be TV, online, et cetera. Only the green is news, and only that tiny little red sliver is what we might call fake news, right? So to put it into scale, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of overall consumption. But that's not all we need to worry about, right? It's not simply a, a problem of volume, because we know that even small groups can have big effects. For instance, those who are most politically engaged are probably more likely to be exposed to this type of thing and thus uh, take political actions based upon it, right? Uh, 
So here's another way of looking at it here. Again, this is not my data. This is data of colleagues of mine studying in the same space, showing that overall consumption of fake news stories is quite low, right? So the modal consumption is zero, what we see there in that bar graph, and immediately drops off to uh, virtually nobody consuming more than two or three fake news articles in the time span there, right? So overall consumption or, or sharing of news links is, is uh, dwarfing that fake news impact, right? And yet we have small influential groups doing that consumption. And so we know that it's uh, overall consumption is low, but it's highly concentrated. So who might that be concentrated among? Who would we think? So we know from this sort of data, it's ideologically concentrated among those with the most conservative news diets. And we know that there are certain demographic factors uh, leading to such concentrations, right? And so here we get to the fun part of the, of, of the slides, right? So we get to talk about conventional wisdom or public discourse around who is susceptible to fake news, right? And so one of my favorite jokes from the 2016 election, your parents in 1996 said, don't trust anyone on the internet. And in 2016, they said, freedomeagle.facebook says Hillary invented AIDS, right? And so this is sort of the, the folk wisdom that older adults have become rapidly partisan and rapidly susceptible to fake news, right? And we see even perhaps uh, the most prominent journalist covering the fake news beat, Craig Silverman, write articles like what to do if older people in your life are sharing false or extreme content, right? Part of BuzzFeed's Protect Your Parents from the Internet Week, right? So this is more evidence that this is in the, in the discourse, in the mainstream. We all just assume old people are most susceptible to fake news, right? And I, I had so much fun with that. I threw another, another slide up here with people younger than I or, or most of us, Zoomers, for instance. This is what they think about older people's consumption of fake news. They think that they're eagerly awaiting the pumpkin of obvious fake news from websites with typos in the name. They, again, draw the parallel between not believing anything on the internet to literally believing everything on the internet, right? And so underlying this is this assumption that older people are, are not digitally sophisticated, right? They're, they're susceptible to scams and obvious fakes online. And in some data from, from a book chapter I wrote a couple of years ago, we even looked at people's perceptions of other groups' consumption of fake news, right? And so especially if we look at those in the youngest age group, 18 to 34, they are especially likely to think that older Americans consume the most and they consume the least, right? It's sort of an identity protective cognition account of perceived exposure. Uh, but we don't see a parallel trend among those over 60, right? They don't assume that people under 34 or 35 are consuming the most, right? So even they are willing to admit that they consume an equal amount, right? And so this is the perception, whether we go with anecdotes from, from the mainstream and from social media or with some actual data. And a friend of mine who studies uh, Political divisions across uh, generations said that this is the OK Boomer graph here, right? So th again, this is what the younger people think about older news consumption. Is this borne out in the data? In fact, it is, right? So if we look at trace data, what we might call uh, you know, behavioral data from the wild, so whether people are visiting these websites through passively metered tracking data or they're sharing such links on Twitter that can subsequently be scraped and classified. We see here in the visit data, um, percent of the, of the groups that are exposed to fake news consistently increases across the lifespan, whether it's in the 2016 election or the 2020 election, although the overall absolute levels have dropped, the trend remains, right? And if we look at share data from Twitter, the similar pattern, right? The majority of those shares are coming in that oldest age group. And so what do we see as a result? We see these calls for age-centered media literacy training, right? Specifically, we need to train older people how to use the internet, how to discern uh, media content online, right? And so we see, for instance, this New York Times article from 2020 about how older adults are particularly vulnerable to misinformation on social media and detailing the new resources available to them to discern true from false. Specifically, it's talking about this grant-funded program I, I believe by researchers out of Stanford and Northwestern, setting up large-scale digital literacy interventions for older adults, right? So they're sort of putting the horse before the cart here, jumping off the assumption of that trace data that mostly consumption and exposure is coming among those oldest groups. 
dealing with this sort of mythic digital divide that older Americans are somehow especially digitally illiterate. Uh, but my argument would be that this is based on intuition, right? Uh, even with that trace data, we don't know exactly uh, whether or not digital literacy would be the solution to this, right? So what does the evidence actually say? And that's what I'm going to detail throughout this talk. But first, a detour, right? So I'm not bad-mouthing digital literacy as a solution here. In fact, I'm going to tell you why it works, right? So I'm going to tell you about a study I did uh, published in 2020 where we uh, tested the effects of digital media literacy interventions in the U.S. and in India. And, you know, not surprisingly, my takeaway is that media literacy is in fact good, right? So probably the largest media literacy intervention ever deployed across the world was a set of 10 brief news tips Facebook deployed, I believe in 2017, at the top of news feeds for millions and millions of people in, across many countries, right? So, for example, these brief news tips included things like be skeptical of headlines, look closely at the URL, investigate the source, and watch for unusual formatting, right? So these are the kind of tips you would give undergraduates in a, in a political communication class or uh, family members who might want to be more digitally literate, right? So these are basic heuristics for judging news that can replace more low effort heuristics like does this agree with my prior beliefs and things like that, right? And so this not necessarily is going to lead to accurate results in judging veracity every time, but these are good shorthand cues that people can take up with minimally invasive training, right? So it's not a semester-long course in how to engage in a literate media lifestyle. This is rather exposure to 10 brief tips that people can use as rules of thumb. But do these actually work, right? So harkening back to the calls for media literacy for older Americans, we've also seen just more generally calls for media literacy, right? And so there's been a lack of rigorous evidence in, in, behind those, whether or not we should devote those resources to that end. There's even a potential for negative spillovers. So if you make people more skeptical in general, you might have a net negative effect because they become more skeptical of mainstream news relative to false news. And these effects might decay really briefly over time, right? So it may not be worth deploying those resources in the first place. And so we looked at this in the U.S. and India, as I mentioned, and specifically we looked post-election 2018 after the midterms. We had about 5,000 people in a representative sample from YouGov. And the main thing they're doing in this survey is a headline task. So they're evaluating the accuracy of a series of headlines that are actually published around this time period. For mainstream news sites as well as uh, articles that had specifically been fact-checked as false by third-party fact-checkers. So the mainstream articles are split between low and high prominent sources as determined by Pew. So if more than 40% of Americans were familiar with the source, we would classify that as high prominent sources. So things like CNN, New York Times, et cetera. Uh, as I mentioned, the false stories were specifically fact-checked as false, and all these were balanced by congeniality. You know, half of them are congenial to Republicans and half of them are congenial to Democrats. So what that looks like in practice is these Facebook uh, news headline previews, because we assume this is actually the way most people consume news. They're headline grazing, they're not reading full articles. So they're looking at a headline, an image, and a URL, right? And so you can imagine this is, they're viewing these one at a time, rating the accuracy, but it looks something like this, right? From a range of sources, a range of stories that are contemporary to the time period. And what we found is, against our own expectations, despite the fact that we pre-registered that, that this would work, we didn't privately really expect it to, right? And yet we found a significant drop in perceived accuracy of false news, a significantly smaller drop in perceived accuracy of mainstream news that post hoc analysis revealed was entirely concentrated in perceived accuracy of low prominence mainstream sources, and hence it's likely that people were using those rules of thumb, they weren't familiar with the source, and hence they downgraded perceived accuracy of it. And still, due to the difference in the size of effects, a considerable increase in discernment between mainstream and false news, right? These effects were not evidently moderated by things we might expect to be, right? So no differences across the congeniality of those headlines, across prior exposure to them. So we exposed them to these headlines in wave one and wave two, a subset in wave one and the full set in wave two. Hence, those that they had previously seen did not undercut the effects of the literacy intervention. And those who were more uh, prone to cognitive reflection at, on a trait level were also no more likely to use or not use uh, the training. So what that looks like visually 
If we collapse the four-point scale of accuracy into a binary scale of accurate or not accurate, we see a sizable drop in perceived accuracy of false news within the intervention and that smaller drop in mainstream news in wave one. And again, against our own internal expectations, this persisted into wave two, which was three weeks later. So we found a considerable drop remaining in perceived accuracy of false news at that time, and the gap uh, in mainstream news had disappeared essentially, right? So again, the discernment effect was still carrying over across those three weeks. A surprisingly durable effect, right? So this tells us they're, they're sort of learning these, these rules of thumb rather than just initially getting an accuracy prime at that first point in time and, and caring more about accuracy just at that one point in time. They were later on still engaging in more uh, thoughtful reflection on these headlines. So we wanted to replicate this outside the US since most of this stuff is really Western based and Western biased. So uh, during this time period, there was a lot of uh, viral rumor diffusion on WhatsApp in India, for instance. And so that was one of the reasons we, we worked in India here. And so we ran two surveys there, one face to face with a, pa uh, a panel that looked more like the US sample, right? So uh, more, more educated, more technologically literate, 90% of whom use WhatsApp. And then we had a face-to-face -face representative panel, which is uh, much less technologically literate, uh, much less educated, right? And so that sort of speaks to the sort of differences we would expect to find in the effects of this intervention. We find in that online panel, which again mirrored or was more close to the US panel and its characteristics, similar pattern of effects, right? Sizable drop in perceived accuracy of false news, uh, sm uh, uh, significant but smaller drop in perceived accuracy of true news and thus, again, better discernment. No effects in the face-to-face -face panel, probably because they had uh, less applicability of this kind of training, right? Because they weren't using WhatsApp in the first place. Again, these effects were not moderated by the congeniality of the headlines in either sample, but unlike the US, there was no carryover effect in the second wave. But here I wanna give a brief shout out to people replicating this work, right? So it's not just these two countries, recent work, it's a working paper circulating right now by Erichar, and colleagues tested these minimal news tips in 16 countries, 33,000 people, broadly effective, right? So that, that line there is the average effect across all these countries, right? So this seems to be a really promising route, right? So really minimal effects of the training, although you might have to engage in it, refresh these ideas since they do decay somewhat, but broadly effective, not just in the West, but across the world. So back to what we're actually talking about. Are older people actually more vulnerable to fake news in the first place and thus in need of media literacy, right? So is this the solution to the problem that we're seeing in that trace data? So the trace data says they are, right? Whether they're consuming, sharing, visiting these websites, but it's a complicated puzzle, right? So reanalysis of other people's survey data, like that headline task I just showed you, show that older adults are actually no worse if not better at discerning true from false in those survey settings, right? So it's a really interesting empirical puzzle if you're an empiricist. Why do we see this disjuncture between the online behavior and the behavior in the lab, in the survey setting? So I'm trying to reconcile this in this project, doing an exploratory analysis of three two-way ViewGov surveys, including the one that had that literacy training embedded within it. So we get Pulse data, which is web browsing behavior. We get the headline task data, and we can check for differences in the effects of that media literacy intervention as well. So the impetus here being targeting programs older adults, older news consumers might be missing the real problem, right? So unless we actually dig down into that, we might be assuming what the problem is before we study it more thoroughly. So recent review article, very prominent review article called Aging and Era of Fake News by a group of psychologists is trying to suss out why we might see this puzzle, right? So they introduce a couple of reasons why, such as literacy deficits, which they're skeptical of. And if you read the title of my talk, you'll realize I'm skeptical of as well. Uh, another possibility is differential motivations. So maybe older people uh, think sharing signifies something different than younger people do, right? So maybe they're not as motivated by accuracy, they're motivated by bonding with others, by derogating out by opponents, things like that, right? We don't know exactly what the motivational differences are. And another possibility that the psychologists forward is cognitive declines, right? So memory issues, things like that. Specifically, when it comes to news exposure, something called the prior exposure effect, which I alluded to earlier, right? So seeing the same content repeatedly increases the perceived veracity of that content across the lifespan. But here, they're, they're speculating that it might be especially true for older Americans, right? They might be more susceptible to prior exposure effects. So I'm testing that speculation as well as a few of my own ideas. 
And so as I alluded to the methods, we look at three, I look at three two-way panels from YouGov, including the one I mentioned earlier. A total of about 10,000 respondents, right, in these representative samples, um, all from 2018, pre and post election, varying sizes, but the total is about 10,000 people, and in all these analysis, we pool across those three surveys. So we have that headline task embedded in there, two different sets of headline stimuli across the three surveys, the prior exposure experiment built in, and the news tips are in the third survey. And along with this, we have the YouGov Pulse panel, right? So a certain subset of these respondents have opted into allowing people to track their web browsing behavior. So we get data from laptop and desktop computers. We don't have mobile, right? So that's one limitation there. But we collect web visit data anonymously through their permission, through a series of plugins, proxies, and VPNs. And then we classify the visits to websites uh, according to pre-constructed lists at the domain level, right? So Mainstream news visits, you might, you might be able to suss out what that is. That's something like visiting CNN and New York Times. Whereas visiting a false news site is visiting any one of 673 domains identified as a false news producer in prior work, right? So we're relying on these prior domain lists other scholars have constructed. And so based on that, so some descriptive data to give you an idea, only about 7% of respondents had visited one of these sites during this time frame. So what do we find when I try to replicate that prior data? So here we have the consumption data, and indeed consumption of false news domains or visits to false news domains increases across the lifespan. So those 60 plus are most likely to have visited one of these binary level and at the count level have consumed more, right? So about 10% of older Americans had visited one of these in this time span, whereas those under 34 are only about 3%. And if we look at discernment and the survey task, older adults are no different from those under 34, right? So 18 to 34 is the comparison group there. Zero is the line from which those would need to be different if they were different effects. We see that they're essentially equally able to discern true from false in the survey setting. So we're subtracting the perceived accuracy of the false news from the perceived accuracy of the mainstream headlines to get that discernment score. And so we're replicating this. Previously, they'd, they'd done this in two separate data sets. I do this here in the same data set, showing that they're Indeed, more likely to be exposed, but no worse in the task setting. And when we look at the media literacy training effects, we see no age differences, right? So age does not moderate the effectiveness of delivering those news tips. And perhaps you might think those effects are more likely to decay for older news consumers over time, but the effect was, again, not moderated. The decay was not moderated by age either. So what about that cognitive account that the psychologist had proposed, right? So, what I do find here is that older Americans are, in fact, more susceptible to prior exposure effects. So uh, across news types, they're more likely to say that it's true if they had seen it in the first wave. And this effect is especially pronounced for the false headlines. However, these differential effects of age are quite small, right? So while they are more susceptible, the substantive size of the effect is quite small. But repeated exposures to viral misinformation say you're not going to see it twice, maybe you see it 20 times, could compound over time, right? So that could enhance the size of this effect in the wild. And so this could be one reason why we see different results between survey and online, right? In the survey, they look at it and they can discern it. Out in the wild, they're seeing it over and over again, gradually becoming more likely to believe that it's true, right? My main argument here is that given the size of this effect, there's probably a bigger issue, right? We're missing the big picture and it relates to partisanship. And so, uh, studies of political socialization, uh, politics across the lifespan will tell you that orientation of politics changes across the lifespan, right? We kind of know this anecdotally as well, right? Because political interest increases over time, over the lifespan. News consumption as a result increases. Older Americans consume more news, vote at higher rates. We know all this to be true. We know that specifically partisan affiliation stabilizes and strengthens over time. So attachments to one's partisan identity become stronger as one ages. And as a result, negative affect, negative feelings towards the out party increase across the lifespan as well. And perhaps as a result, a need to derogate out partisans increases, right, via news behavior. So speculatively, if you're feeling more attached to your party and you hate the out party more and more as you age, you feel a greater need to share news that makes the other side look bad. So what do we see when we zoom out and take this into account, right? That people, older Americans are more interested in politics and consuming in the first place. Well, 
If we look beyond just exposure to the false news websites and include the mainstream websites, we see it's sort of a volume issue here, right? So there's greater exposure to dubious and mainstream news domains as one ages. Specifically, if we look at the scale here, the scale increases radically, as you might imagine, given the context information I gave you at the beginning. Most of the news consumption is not happening here in fake news, right? It's happening in mainstream news. And so part of what's happening here is since they're consuming so much more news overall, we end up seeing slightly more news that is fake in that overall consumption pattern, right? At the same time, again, based on that changing orientation to politics, we see the affect of polarization in this data increases over time. So the way we calculate this is we take two feeling thermometers and we take rating of the out party, subtract it from feelings toward one's own party, and the resulting measure is a measure of affective polarization, which we show increases across the lifespan, right? And this trickles down into news behaviors and evaluations of headlines, right? So they also display older people, those in the oldest age group, display greater congeniality bias. And by that I mean they're more likely to rate a headline as true, regardless of whether or not it's true or false, uh, if it is congenial to their party, right? If it is one that is slanted towards their partisan leanings. So if we look at wave one, we see a pretty radical drop off across these age groups with perceived accuracy of uncongenial news. So it's actually concentrated in ratings of uncongenial headlines, right? They're, they're especially likely to say things that are uncongenial to their party or untrue. And if we look at wave two, the effect increases. So secondary exposure to this, uh, perhaps compounding with the prior exposure effect, we see uh, significantly greater congeniality bias among older Americans, both for uncongenial and congenial headlines in the second wave. And side note, the same age moderated congeniality bias holds for a series of topical misperceptions. So another thing we included in these surveys were batteries of uh, some topical political knowledge, so things about, say, Brett Kavanaugh's appointment, immigration concerns, Trump, Russia, etc. Uh, a, a mix of true and false statements. If we look at uh, people's ability to discern between those true and false topical statements, we see greater congeniality bias in those statements, again, among the oldest uh, survey respondents. And so what this says to me is uh, one of my favorite working theories about why people engage with fake news comes from a study by Osmondson and colleagues published in APSR last year who say that individuals report, who report hating their political opponent are most likely to share fake news and selectively share content that's useful for derogating these opponents. And overall, fake news sharing is fueling, being fueled by the same motivations that drive other forms of partisan behavior, including sharing plain old partisan news. So part of what they argue is happening is that it's simply a supply issue. People are looking to derogate their opponents, their opponents if they are especially affectively polarized, and since the fake news is there, they're willing to share it, right? But if that wasn't there, they would share partisan news that is likely biased also, right? And so what we see in this data is I've been withholding some information from you. I've been withholding the ratings of hyperpartisan news. And so while you see, again, those, those discernment between mainstream and false headlines do not differ across these age groups, we see significant, significant drop off among the oldest respondents for subtracting hyperpartisan perceived accuracy from mainstream perceived accuracy. So they're especially susceptible to hyperpartisan news rather than falsity per se. And so what is hyperpartisan news? Well, it's a lot like false news, at least in our survey design, except it hasn't been explicitly fact-checked as false, right? So it's things coming from very ideological websites. There's a technical definition of these. So based on who is sharing these, these uh, articles from, from a given domain, we classify them as being uh, more or less liberal or conservative. So those that are among the most ideological news outlets, we took uh, headlines from those, specifically ones that had not been fact-checked as false, and those are what the oldest age group are most susceptible to, right? So coupled with that congeniality bias, it shows us that they're looking to derogate opponents through their new sharing behavior, right? And so one thing that's worth pointing out is that this hyperpartisan news that is not explicitly fact-checked as false is likely a better match with that trace data that is telling us that older Americans share more in the first place, right? So remember that these are coded at the domain level. So at you know, the website level rather than the article level. And hence, most of what's being shared is probably not false per se, has not been fact-checked as false. It's just coming from websites with a bad track record in general. And hence, it looks something like this, right? So things like Breitbart, et cetera, right? And so uh, 
Those are being classified as low quality or dubious news sources and with good reason, and yet they're not explicitly fact-checked as false, and so that can help explain why we see, again, this di disjuncture between survey and trace data. And this is something we should really worry about because this is a greater share of news diets overall, right? It's a much greater proportion of what people are consuming and sharing than those false news uh, stories per se. And so, to sum up, my argument is that affective polarization is a real issue here. Uh, so calls for literacy training, especially targeted at older Americans, are well-meaning. It can be effective, as I walked through our literacy tips effects, but unlike, unlikely to address the gap between younger and older Americans sharing and consumption behaviors, right? So my argument would be that we need to address affective polarization, which is we need to admit is a difficult long-term project, right? So these are global structural shifts. It's not just in the U.S., and so we can't just solve these with one-offs, right? We can't just say, hey, here's a, here's a 4th of July celebration and everybody loves each other again. Your news consumption is going to be fixed. So it's worth mentioning a couple limits to these findings, right? So this is the U.S. only. The Pulse panel has a lot of limits in terms of what we can track given people's exposure to news, right? It's only specifically clicking on, on uh, hyperlinks, so it's not exposure per se in somebody's news feed. It's covered at the domain and not article level, as we've discussed. This is a lot of non-news, right? So we don't know what kind of memes people are seeing and social media posts, which if you go back and look at a fact check website's most recently fact check claims, they're mostly coming from the latter, right? There's not a lot of fake news at the hyperlink domain sort of level that's, uh, that is making an indent in people's uh, news diets right now. Uh, and of course, I don't test some of those alternative explanations. Uh, for instance, other psychologists oppose changes in social trust, motivations over the lifespan, right? So we can't rule those out either. But to, to, to sum up and some ending notes here, um, again, I want to stress, I don't think literacy training is a bad idea. And it, I'm just trying to under, underline the importance of evidence-based policy with this talk. It's important to emphasize the structural nature of these problems, remind ourselves not to focus on one-off interventions when we're trying to to fix the world, right? So we need to study these root causes of these pathologies we see in our news environments. Thank you. Can you differentiate misinformation, disinformation, and fake news for me? Or are they more or less synonymous? Yeah, I mean, so I wrote a, a book chapter in, a, in, a, in recent years where we tried to do this. So. I think the, the key differentiator you will find that people say between misinformation and disinformation is that disinformation has intent behind it. It's often coming from the state level or something like that, right? Whereas misinformation can be spread unintentionally, right? Um, and, and fake news per se, the people who study fake news are often talking about uh, something that specifically imitates the format of traditional news sites, right? So. Um, so a, a social media post that has an incorrect claim wouldn't be fake news under their sort of definition, right? Well, fake news is probably a poor construct to try to use, but uh, I think they're often specifically talking about fabricated news or, or fully uh, cut from whole cloth uh, untruths spread via a news hyperlink type format. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have a more demographic information about these old people? Because old people are very heterogeneous groups. So I was wondering if you, if you have any access to their different kind of identity, you know, race and gender, you know, rural, urban, whatever. Yeah, so I haven't looked at the demographics broken out by age group, but the overall samples come from representative samples of Americans. And so uh, I would assume that it would be fairly representative once broken out, but it wasn't specifically, the representativeness wasn't targeted across age groups, right? So um, I don't know exactly what the demographic breakdown is, but I would assume it skews, uh, skews Republican, skews white, or whatever the actual breakdowns are in the U.S. demographics. Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, I'm just curious, does that breakdown, breakdown kind of give you a different kind of approach, or? Well, I'm not sure. So here I'm trying to engage with prior work where people are, are simply just using these kind of coarse uh, age groups, right? And so I'm, I'm employing the same approach so I can speak back to that work. Um, I also, you know, all these analyses I also did at 
uh, using a linear age term, right? Uh, but I prefer to at least present it using the age groups because it's easier to consume and I think uh, helps check for a kind of nonlinearity, right? So a lot of times the effects are concentrated among those over 60 specifically. Yeah, you mentioned that one of the limitations is the, the US only sample, right? And I think when I think about hyperpartisanship, we often think about this in the US context because of the two party system. So I'd be really interested in your thoughts on kind of um, how you think this might play out and maybe some like potential solutions on like a global, more global level, you know, given your experience in Europe as well. Yeah, I mean, just more broadly speaking, I think it's really great to study misinformation outside of two-party system, right? Because otherwise we're doing sort of uh, cultural psychology or something that's really specific to our weird two-party system, right? And so we have studied a lot of misinformation across Europe and Spain and other multi-party countries. And what we find is uh, less, you know, less partisan division around a lot of these, at least science and health misperceptions, um, but kind of the same kind of underlying trait level distrust of experts driving a lot of these misperceptions. But in the US, it happens to uh, align with our partisan divisions. As far as uh, news in general, um, I, would, I think that the you know, uh, socialization of, of uh, political identity, things like that, would probably be pretty similar, although we know that, again, partisan attachments are weaker in multi-party systems. Um, but I think we would expect to find similar volume issues, at least in terms of uh, helping explain why we would see greater fake news sharing among older people. Were you going to say something? No, I guess, I mean, I guess that would be a good test of the hyperpartisan sort of hypothesis, right? If it were weaker in... Say that know, again? If it, if it were weaker in countries with multiple yeah. parties. Yeah, right? that's a good point. Yeah, again, even though... <laughs> The, the APSR article is by all these uh, Danish scholars, they're still looking at the US, right? And so unfortunately, way too much of our research focuses on the US and it'd be great to test this elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for this really interesting talk and this is such important research. I, I have lots of questions, but I'm just gonna start with one kind of broad one. I thought it was interesting and useful how you started by interrogating the idea that misinformation is bad. In other words, you didn't just grant that. You, you sort of walked us through some of the problems with misinformation circulation. I was struck at the end, you seem to assume that we want to close the affective polarization gap. And so I, I, I'd love to hear you interrogate that in the same way you interrogated the earlier assumption. In other words, is the gap what we should care about in affective polarization? Yeah, I guess this is a really good question. So I guess the assumption is that if we care about a gap in news sharing, which is driving um, the calls for digital literacy, um, we would actually care about closing that affective polarization gap. But as you, as you mentioned, I didn't do a good job of interrogating whether or not that's the case. Although we do know affective polarization has all these negative outcomes as well, right? So people. Uh, don't use as much information when they're voting. They're much more likely to rely on party cues, and then you get more extreme candidates winning primaries and things like that, right? And you get people unwilling to punish people who commit democratic norm violations and things like that as well. Um, if we just care about the, the quality of the news that is in the social media ecosystem, I think we could argue that uh, affective polarization would be important to reduce there as well, right? Because uh, I think it's a, it's a point that the Osmonds Osmondson article makes as well is that uh, a lot of this hyperpartisan stuff is, isn't outright false, but it's super biased, and that can also uh, contribute to really distorted perceptions of the outgroup, which in turn drives perceived distance from the outgroup and unwillingness to engage in civil discourse and things like that. Other questions? Yes. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm not super familiar with this field, but I'm just kind of curious, you know, we've kind of seen social media platforms doing more and more of kind of their own fact checking or kind of like, you know, if you go to retweet something that has an article in it, Twitter will be like, hey, you haven't read this article. Are you sure you want to share it without reading it? Um, and then also Facebook will kind of be like, oh, this was posted by an account that's associated with kind of, you know, 
fake news or, or this misinformation. And so I'm just kind of curious if there's any like research on whether that kind of fact checking actually like works or that little like reminder if that actually like makes a difference. Yeah, so specifically thinking about that reminder on Twitter, I think that's actually informed by some research by people uh, studying accuracy primes, right? So as I mentioned, uh, the media literacy training seems to work through actually teaching some shortcuts rather than priming accuracy. So I'm distinguishing that from work that others have done that says people care about accuracy, but they forget about that when they're online, and they're not paying attention to it. So if you remind people to pay attention to accuracy and care about what they're sharing about, they'll share uh, more high quality news sources, right? And so they, they tested that, similar to that, they give people prompts and then they tested the actual quality of the news links people are sharing subsequently in, field, in a field experiment, right? And so I think, uh, not that they've tested that per se, I'm sure Twitter has internally, but I think that that is a research informed intervention that the platform is doing. And Twitter seems to be more willing to do that than, than Facebook per se. Um, they, Facebook has played around with this a lot, so around the time that this was uh, all percolating in, in 2017, I think Facebook was trying out like disputed tags that said, hey, this article has been disputed by third party fact checkers. I don't think they do that anymore. But at the time, you know, that has significant effects on perception of accuracy of that individual article. Um, but other people who tested similar interventions in experimental settings showed those spillover effects. So when I was citing that Clayton article on potential spillover effects of media literacy training, again, uh, research shows that that might cause uh, kind of a, a halo or a negative halo effect where you're kind of poisoning the well and making people more cynical and distrustful of news in general, right? So there is there's quite a bit of uh, empirical tests of these sort of applied solutions um, and there's not a solid through line between them. It's a little bit piecemeal, but yeah, I think there's, there's research behind those to some degree or another. I think well, that might be one reason, for instance, Facebook has abandoned that disputed tag due to that sort of research that says it might have these broader deleterious effects. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. What effect do you think <clears throat> all this has? Uh, it, it, it appears to me, as an old guy, um, <laughs> representative, representative of two of the groups you named, um, <laughs> It appears to me that a lot of news now, especially in this country, I don't know about Europe, but it appears that it, it's entertainment. It's not news. And how much of that is just people watching for entertainment, clicking for entertainment, sharing with their friends for entertainment, and how would that skew it? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what we, we uh, for instance, the Brashears article was speculating about, so that the meaning, the motivation behind sharing uh, might have changed and especially changed for those who are older or those um, who, who uh, might just happen to be more partisan, right? And so uh, I think that is something that we probably see, but I can't tell with this data, right? But I think that given that, uh, that kind of derogating the out, out, uh, out party, the opponent thing that I'm talking about is similar to this entertainment thing, right? You're not sharing it because you think it's accurate or real, you're sharing it because it's entertaining or uh, makes you feel good when you're doing it, right? And so I do think that's a, a serious issue that is underlying this as well, uh, but I can't speak specifically to it with this survey data since I analyzed this after the fact given the, the rise in interest in it among other scholars. So I was interested in the earlier study, the uh, media literacy intervention that you presented to set this up. I was surprised that I think the variable was called cognitive reflection didn't have an effect. That that surprised me a little. I just I figured that would be a pretty obvious factor. But so I mean, I'm just curious what what you thought about that when you when you saw that. Did did your group also think it would that would probably matter? I mean, not yeah, I mean, that's why we it. tested yeah. we tested these as potential yeah. moderators. Yeah. So right? what's your what's your thought on why it didn't? So it has a main effect, of course, right? Yeah. So people yeah. who are more cognitive and reflective are more discerning in their news behaviors. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly why it doesn't moderate these effects, right? So maybe it's the case that uh, people who are more reflective are, are pretty good at taking up cues uh, given, once given those tips, they're good at applying those, whereas uh, those who might be not as good have more ground to cover, so they have a, uh, you know, 
uh, it might be something like a ceiling effect, I think is what I'm trying to say. Like, so those who are more cognitively reflective might be already be pretty discerning to begin with, and you're moving a lot of ground up with those who are not as reflective to begin with. I don't know, though. I mean, we, we, we didn't probe that. It's sort of like a secondary thing we, we were looking at. It's a good question. Yeah? You, you talked a little bit about something called a feeling thermometer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm suspicious of that idea, so I want to hear more about it. Can you, can you explain what that is? It's a, it's a method, I guess? Or yeah, it's just a measurement question? where you, act, you ask about feelings towards groups or individuals. Um, so, for instance, you might ask, how do you feel about scientists? How do you feel about Democrats? How do you feel about the media? And it's on a, a 0 to 100 point scale. So it's basically just a, like, it's like a Likert scale or anything else. It just has more variation in it. So you're, you're just getting a, like a kind of like a raw affect, like a gut feeling a, a, about certain groups. How much do you like this group, essentially? Did you correlate any of that data to the cognitive reflection that Kevin was asking about? No, I haven't looked at that. Those, those things seem to be getting at different modalities of approaching the news. So in the cognitive reflection one, it's perhaps more logical, thinking this through, rationalizing what's going on, looking at the circumstances. In the feeling thermometer, sort of that side of the things, it's more impulsive, intuitive, yeah. gut level, immediate. Um, that, those relationships seem like an important one to sort of tease out the, the difference. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is, though, that these are at the trait level, right? So these are just kind of like background uh, trait level characteristics somebody is walking around with. And they might manifest differently in situations where people are in the process of engaging with news, right? So I think they're orthogonal, right? So somebody might be very cognitive reflective in general. The cognitive reflection test is actually asking them sort of uh, a series of questions that have uh, so, uh, an obvious but wrong answer. So like if you pass, you're running a race and you pass the person in second place, what place are you in? You might, if you don't think through it, you might say you're in first, but you're actually in second, right? And then there's a kind of more numerical versions of those questions as well. Like a bat and a ball cost a dollar and 10 cents together. One costs a dollar more than the other. How much does each cost? Things like that. Um, and so uh, people who are thinking through those sort of word games um, might also still be very affectively polarized. They might be very interested in politics as a result of their, their greater uh, you know, need for cognition or something, so they engage with politics all the time and they hate the out party as a result. So they might be working in tandem. Somebody might be super polarized and super uh, high on the cognitive reflection scale, so they might use that to engage in greater motivated reasoning, right? So when they read a news article, given those two things working together, you might be especially likely to come away with a biased uh, interpretation of that evidence. But that's a good question. I haven't looked at the relationship between those two specifically. We need a political scientist here to really vigorously defend feeling thermometers. That's, you know, yeah. it's, the, it's the favorite yeah. metric of political scientists in particular. So, yeah. Yeah. so, so my co-authors are political scientists <laughs> on these projects, right? But also, like, the feeling thermometer is often relative to what else right. is in the, in the scale, right? Like, what else is listed yeah. next to that? That's true. I feel like it's pretty relative. So I think we ask, you know, Democrat, Republican, media, the president, I think it was President Trump at the time, and a few other things. Um, I don't know, they're, 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 used, uh, they're standard on the American National Election Survey, which has been running for, for decades, so that's why we use it. I think, uh, I mean, people bunch up at 50, 75, 100, or whatever, right? And so you see huge bunches on those. You don't really need a 100-point scale, but that's what we use. Yeah. I feel like I'm sitting here, I come from old school and <laughs> maybe demographically I have to be categorized as uh, old people because I was very confused with all this terminology you're using, like first news, fake news, disinformation, misinformation, mainstream and first news. I feel like those things can be overlapping, you know, in, in, in lay people's conversation and even in scholarly dialogues. And to me, I don't buy dichotomy between mainstream news and first news at all. Mm -hmm. um, they are not mutually exclusive. I mean, I see uh, mainstream news all the time first, right? Mm -hmm. they, they have a better skill to legitimize their politically biased news, yeah. right? Yeah. So how are you going to deal with those kind of confusion here? Like how you, how you communicate your definition to your research audience? 
So, I mean, I guess it's important to realize we're talking about averages, right? So on average, we would rather people consume news from, uh, from mainstream websites than really fringe websites that are wrong a majority of the time, right? And so of course, a lot of uh, false news stories are issued by, by mainstream outlets, but they tend to engage in, in legitimate uh, processes that news outlets should, right? They engage in corrections, they formally retract things, whereas these sketchy domains are, are purely profit-driven for the most part, or, or maybe they're interested in harming their opponents or something like that. They're not engaging in the norms of news production, right? They're throwing things up to get clicks, um, and often wrong because they know it's sensational, but they don't care. They're not engaging in corrections and things like that. So, uh, of course, it's very contentious in what gets put on these lists for, for low-quality news sites and dubious news sites. Uh, but I think if we're thinking about, on average, what people are consuming, it's inarguable that they're low qual lower quality of news content overall, right? And so there's no perfect news. We're not, we're not uh, elevating and championing mainstream news, but we don't want people to become needlessly skeptical of all media that they're consuming, which is a disinformation technique, right? So, for instance, Russian disinformation is not trying to get anybody to take up one given narrative. They're trying to uh, increase cynicism in all narratives or something like that, right? So here we're simply distinguishing between the scummiest uh, web domains versus what we would traditionally expect to be normal news, which is not, we're not specifically not saying that the mainstream news is correct, but we are distinguishing it from those that are uh, consistently low quality. Ben, thank you very much for joining us today.